Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, precious beloved saint. You are a saint of the deeper life, desiring the uh, meat of God's word, not satisfied with the bread of his word, nor the milk of his word, but you are a chosen saint for such a time as this, and you are hungry for the deeper things of God. We are so excited to finally be back with you once again. Where have you been? <laughs> it seems like forever that we've been able to uh, come to you at a, with a live feed. Tina and I have been out of the country and we uh, got back just a couple of days ago. We actually endeavored to try to uh, upload and uh, try to do some live uh, uh, streaming, but the data in the uh, hotel and other locations weren't strong enough to be able to upload, to uh, produce um, any type of recording or a live stream. So we are back at our base camp in the Northwest for uh, just uh, probably a few more weeks, God willing, and then we will head south um, and uh, continue on in terms of uh, meetings that we have already scheduled out and then heading uh, further south into Mexico, South America, Central America, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All of that to say, so many stories to tell you, so many wonderful things God has been doing. It would take really the fullness of an hour to even share some of the wonderful things God is doing in some of the meetings and in, uh, in God's people. I just want to give you one little small thing. We had one young woman that she had uh, and is married for a little over a year and wanted to have a child. And she, uh, a, a brand new baby Christian, <coughs> and she wanted to uh, uh, plan it out and have it at this particular time. And so they were endeavoring to uh, become pregnant and uh, uh, weeks uh, turned into a couple of months. And so uh, there was deep, as you can imagine, anguish and heart cry and bewilderment and bewilderment. Why? Hasn't God um, brought forth um, a positive uh, pregnancy uh, within her womb? And uh, so anyway, she had come to us and, uh, and uh, asked for us to give her some insight and to pray for her that she would become pregnant. Now, um, we've got a decent track record of uh, barren women. Uh, I still have photos of barren women. Uh, bringing forth children throughout India and Asia and other areas and here, of course, in our beautiful country. Um, so uh, she shared, you know, that she, um, you know, again, a brand new baby Christian, not very old in God. She, uh, without knowing the terminology, she fleeced. And she said, oh God, I've prayed and nothing's happened yet and we wanted to have the baby at this time and, and this would be the most convenient time and on and on. And so she said, uh, you know, God, if you're, if you're going to cause my womb to uh, be filled with fruitfulness, may the next morning, the next day, may I see uh, monarch butterflies basically everywhere. So as she was sharing this with me, she said she got up and that next day there were monarch butterflies everywhere. So she thought for sure, this is the sign that I'm going to be pregnant. Well, guess what? Days turned into weeks and another month and second month passed and no uh, pregnancy uh, within her womb. <clears throat> and so I kind of walked her through New Testament uh, uh, teaching and doctrine that you and I are no longer led by fleecing signs. We are led by God's word through growing faith and we are led by God's spirit uh, according to again our Bible. And so I shared that with her, shared again that God's plan may not be our plan, but I was so filled with faith for her <clears throat> I prayed over her, commanded the womb to be fruitful. Uh, the Bible speaks of uh, uh, you know seven barren women that brought forth a fruitful womb, um, commanded fruitfulness from her womb, and then again filled with so uh, so much faith during that encounter, as well as uh, a strong anointing, I believe, coming in. 
told her that she was going to uh, be pregnant uh, the next week. And so the uh, service and everything closed up, go back to our room and hotel, laying there enjoying the fruitfulness of a great meeting, a great in, uh, gathering together. And um, as, 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 you know, things began to wear off, uh, you know, many of you that have done things with God, you know, sometimes that, uh, most times at least, that strong anointing will wane a little bit. And, uh, and so I'm, uh, now I'm like, uh, uh, hey, hey uh, you know, I'm starting to like, uh-oh, I just commanded fruitfulness and told this woman next week she's going to have a child. And uh, so I'm like, um, uh, okay, God, um, I, I think I, 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 I got your, your name into kind of a, you know, some, a, a trouble spot, kind of got you in a mess. And, and yeah, I kind of got, got me in a mess in there too. And, uh, and I told, you know, this woman that she was going to have a baby the next week. And so, uh, you know, you know, and, and I'm like, you know, can you, can you get, us out of this mess that I put us in and uh, and that was kind of uh, what I was feeling you know after you declare and after you proclaim and uh, and then you know it begins to wane uh, days later of what was said what was done what was prophesied um, uh, beloved um, you know we just continue to intercede and to the Bible says to war a good warfare please listen war a good warfare over the prophecies that have come unto you. And so we interceded, stood in the gap for this young woman, this young couple. And beloved, in a, a, I think it was one day later or two days later, I think it was the next day, we received an email from her and she uh, was giving so much praise and glory to God that she became pregnant. And uh, what a glory to God that he uh, will reach down in spite of uh, the situations, the complexities, and now uh, she is uh, uh, filled with great faith and joy and uh, giving praise and glory to God. She sent us a photo of the heartbeat of that uh, little baby in her womb. And so we celebrate the faithfulness, the goodness, the miraculous work of your God and mine. Beloved, I went too long even on that story. We got we got so many things and so much that God is doing. But, uh, beloved, I just want to move on in our teaching today and, uh, and just, uh, again, share that we miss you and we look forward to, again, hopefully um, um, uh, spending some, uh, uh, some live time with you as God would allow. If not, um, with our schedule, this is just how it's kind of working out this, uh, uh, this season so, beloved, I want to uh, uh, move into part four uh, with a series we've entitled The Fifth um, M for Becoming an Amazing Christian. We've endeavored to reduce down uh, 10 M's in your Bible whereby we would be classified by God and by man that truly, that is an amazing saint. That is a Christian I can model my life after. The Bible says that Jesus became flesh. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That people need to see a modeling. They need to see boots on the ground. What does this spiritual life look like just just living it out here and now on this earth. And so with that, I want you to uh, open up your Bible and uh, just two primary uh, texts, uh, foundational stones that you can and I can uh, put our lives upon um, with this theme, how to become an amazing Christian in man's sight and in God's sight. Hebrews chapter 11 Verses 32 through 40. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 32 through 40. We've read this uh, each time and, and uh, 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 pray that it becomes just part of your engrafted word. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 32 through 40. Uh, King James says, And what shall I say? For the time would uh, 
fail me to tell you about Gideon, about Barak, about Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, the prophets, about uh, the harlot Rahab, uh, about uh, Moses' Uh, parents, Jochebed and, and Amram, and about their faith, not worried uh, and fearful about the edicts of Pharaoh, and on and on, and this, this, this list of amazing saints goes on to say, verse 33, through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, closed the mouths of lions, enemies, quenched uh, violence and escaped the edge of the sword. And here is their common denominator of all of these amazing saints, beloved. You should circle this in your Bible. Out of weakness were made strong. All of them had such a personal, please listen, a personal weakness that they had to become dependent upon God who is their strength. Never feel uh, your weakness is a hindrance. That weakness that I'm not able is really a strength where God comes in and He is the one that is, is generating the force, the power, the thrust of God in and through you. He goes on to say, made uh, a valiant in fight, turned to flight armies. Women received their dead, raised to life again, and others. Beloved, that's you. I have been able to meet with many of you through the course of three churches and 35 years of full-time ministry and others of you in conferences and meetings throughout many, many, many nations. Others is you and others. goes on to say, went through torturings and, accept, and did not accept deliverance that they might receive a better resurrection. They understood that the, um, the millennium and the new heavens and the new earth, you're going to have levels of position, authority, and resurrection power. And he goes on, and others had trials of crucifixions on and on and on, stoned, left in uh, caves, etc., all having received a good report of faith looking forward to even the greater promises that God has that God has beloved the second scripture is found in 2nd Peter chapter 3 verse 8 2nd Peter chapter 3 verse 8 Peter says now be not ignorant five places in your Bible that we're instructed not to be ignorant ignorant isn't a bad word it just means I'm not aware I didn't know be, be not ignorant. One other translation, the Berean Bible says, Let not this one thing escape your notice. Let not this one thing escape your notice, that a day unto the Lord is as what? Most of you know, a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. Why is that so important and imperative for you and I to not lose focus and sight upon it? Because God has prophetic um, days. He has prophetic years. He has a prophetic timetable and a calendar and remember beloved a day is as to the Lord a thousand years and a thousand years is as a day to the Lord okay so let's pray as we jump in to our fifth M called how to become an amazing saint an amazing Christian, 10 M's. Lord, I thank you again for the valuable gift of time that you have given each of us right now that is listening, watching, and one day will. We would pray that your bountiful grace and mercy would explode in our lives, that you would even call and raise the spiritual dead to life again, even as you called Lazarus. May you again move mightily within our lives today, that we might run this race with great fervor, with great fire, force, and passion, for you in the name of Jesus Christ. I thank you for your beloved saints. I command blessing over the soles of their feet and the uh, 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 workings of their hands. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
men. Beloved, 10 M's for becoming an amazing Christian. You and I have read just a small exploit of men and women and others through weakness became strong that these were classified by God and by men that they were truly amazing Christians. And you are one of the others. You may not be noted or named within your Bible, but God knows your name. He told Elijah that he wasn't the only one that had not bowed down to Jezebel and King Ahab. God says, I have 7,000 that have not bowed down their knee, nor have they kissed the hand of Jezebel. I know those who are mine. God knows you. He knows your life, your heart. He knows you are becoming like me. We're in process of becoming an amazing Christian. Christian 10 M's that we've endeavored to pull out and to uh, flesh out and to say this is how we can be categorized in the eyes of God in the eyes of man that we are truly an amazing Christian for his glory Luke 2 52 your Bible says that Jesus grew in favor grew in wisdom wisdom in the sight of God and in the sight of men, he grew in wisdom and favor in the sight of God, in the sight of men. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 3, 2, that you and I are living epistles, living letters, seen on the outside, that's important, and known on the inside. You and I are living letters, walking around, talking, living, doing life, and yet God says you're more than that, you are in a living letter. That people see you, first impressions can be last impressions, okay. And so you are seen and you are read. People get to know you, who you really are. We want to make sure that our, uh, um, the brand, the ambassadorship, he calls you an ambassador. That you and I, the, the ambassador, you are an ambassador. You are from another kingdom. You are representing another kingdom. You, you are an ambassador of him. And that brand of Christianity we are, we are praying will bring glory to him and not cause people to, to walk away, to disdain, and not to have the beautiful grace that would be brought into them through how we represent Jesus Christ and the Father. You and I are being likened and coming into the same image of Jesus Christ. Uh, we, you and I with unveiled faces, 2 Corinthians 3.18. You and I with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into His glory with ever increasing glory in the same image which comes from the Lord. What's he saying? When I come to Him and I, and I fellowship with Him and I spend time with Him that I am being transformed from glory to glory and coming into the very image of Jesus Christ. Now if I in these 10 M's. If I forfeit them. If I don't care about them. If I just continue uh, without uh, understanding. I'm damaging that uh, 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 grace. To possibly bring someone closer in to Jesus Christ. And, and salvation. The Bible calls those areas that are um, basically flawed in my life, those uncircumcised areas of the flesh. The Bible calls those dead flies that spoil the anointing of God in your life. Ecclesiastes 10.1 Dead flies give the anointing oil a stench, a stink. Okay, and we know the Bible says in Matthew 12, 24, that one of the names of Satan is Beelzebub, the Lord of the flies. So when we have already gone through four of the M's, of the ten M's, manners, mouth, ministry, and morality, any of those areas that are falling uh, woefully short, then that is a dead fly in the anointing of your life that brings a stench that can cause someone from not coming closer or coming in to the salvation of Jesus Christ. I have so many 
wonderful stories to share with you of those that have been exposed and are coming in to the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, I want my life to not have any dead flies that would bring a stench to God's abiding anointing that's in you and me. That's what the book of John says. You have an abiding anointing that He's given you at salvation. You can grow it. And yet, I don't want to have dead flies that bring a stench to it. So any area of these ten M's that fall again, woefully short, we are uh, uh, bringing a blemish uh, the Bible says, uh, uh, a spot, uh, the Bible speaks of uh, on our uh, uh, lives and testimony and representation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, lastly, remember, beloved, you cannot and I have these 10 M's uh, just imparted into you by a gifted man or a woman. They don't come from a prophetic and apostolic man or a woman by laying hands on you and then endeavoring to impart uh, the first M of manners in your life or, uh, or, 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 or the tongue of our mouths. These come through the deep working of God's word and the crucifixion uh, of the life found in Jesus Christ of the cross and an experiential outworking of God's grace grace in my life and so with that we're going to now uh, uh, quickly uh, just move right in and remind you and I number one we said the first M was manners and beloved I'm just going to take a, 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 I'm taking too much time with this <laughs> I need five hours okay um uh, so uh, manners, uh, how I how I deal with people, how I I leave the home and I integrate with people on the freeway and in the supermarkets and and neighbors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. One illustration or one example of the need for manners uh, took place just I think it was yesterday. I went to get uh, coffee and uh, uh, at, at this uh, shop up the road here. And as I came in, I looked to my right, and this uh, gentleman came up, and he, uh, I looked at him. I hadn't seen him in probably, I don't know, three decades, 35 uh, years, somewhere in there. And he recognized me, and we hugged, and he's a Christian uh, uh, person. And, uh, and so we have, we have had, uh, uh, in, the, in times past, fellowship together. Um, and so we got to just, uh, you know, hug and love you and what's been going on quickly. But he, was, he had someone else with him there in the coffee shop. And so as I turned to go, who are you here with? I looked over and, beloved, I saw an individual who is one of our neighbors here in this area. Tina and I walk this area when we can and we endeavor to uh, show ourselves friendly and to have proper biblical manners of smiling and being kind and, and um, um, you know, sharing about, oh, that's, those are beautiful flowers, that's a beautiful, um, you, know, you know, whatevers, and endeavoring to, uh, to, to, to show ourselves um, the life and the fullness of joy uh, for those around us and let our light shine, okay? And I looked over and it was one of our neighbors. And the person that I know said, well, this is such and such. And uh, I've known him for, you know, 30 years or whatever. And he uh, uh, has been going to the same church, um, you know, that I uh, go to. And for the last, you know, 25, 30 years as well, yada, yada, yada. The point was that the man he, my friend was with was one of my neighbors and had been going to the same uh, uh, church uh, for 25 or 30 years and um, uh, that church uh, uh, used to be a spirit-filled church and a full gospel church. I don't know what it is anymore, but nonetheless, that neighbor that we know, I was so shocked. He probably saw my jaw drop. Why? Because he has been one of the most rudest, one of the most meanest, one of the most uh, unhappy uh, People, gruff, wouldn't wave, wouldn't smile at anybody. And here my friend is pointing out that he is a Christian that he's meeting with on and on and on. And the guy's friend has been in God for, 
I don't know, 30, 40 years. And he saw me look at him and I can tell, uh, I came home and told Tina, I know he was so convicted. Why? Because of the bibl lack of biblical manners of just joy, uh, of uh, humility, of politeness, kindness, um, of, of, of showing oneself friendly, of endeavoring to uh, build a bridge for someone. to. He didn't know I was a Christian. He didn't know I was any of that. We kind of try to come in it on a stealth level. And so we find here that that individual uh, certainly uh, was, uh, uh, you know, filled with, uh, you know, a, a sense of, wow, he couldn't even hardly look at me. He couldn't even hardly look at me. So all of that to say is that I want so much to be a good representation of the 10 M's. Number one, manners. Number two, mouth. Number three, ministry. You are in full-time ministry. And number four, morality. I just want to touch that area one more time before we move into the fifth one today, which is money. But the fourth one you and I talked about last time together, morality, and I shared with you, it is of my opinion, not just mine, that we have moved in to what your Bible speaks of, which is called the Feast of Trumpets, the fifth feast mentioned in your Bible. Beloved, these feasts uh, are found in Leviticus chapter 23, verses 4 through 8, and the book of uh, Numbers as well, uh, and, uh, and other uh, uh, places. But the sharing of this and uh, these feasts, beloved, these are seven stages of your Christian growth. The seven feasts are symbolic for a lot of things, but one of the things has to do with you as a Christian and also as you and I, the church corporate, the church uh, corporate worldwide. You and I, these seven feasts are seven stages. God is wanting you to experience these seven feasts. Jesus Christ has fulfilled them all and now we, his body, are in process of fulfilling them. You and I have already been taught the Feast of Passover speaks of your salvation. Exodus here, uh, you could find this also in Exodus chapter 12, the Passover lamb. You must eat the Passover lamb. And, and, they, and they spoke uh, uh, a volume of what um, one is to do with this Passover lamb. It speaks of salvation. Jesus is the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. You must experience this, this salvation through the lamb of God. No one, no thing else. Um, uh, two was uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Leaven was a type of sins. The next day of that feast, you were to go into your house and take actually a feather brush and clean all of the leaven out of the cupboards, out of the floors, any place there is leaven. He is saying, second stage, now that you have the blood and the power of the Lamb that comes through the blood of Jesus Christ, you now have the power to eradicate every single area of flesh, of leaven, of sins in your life and mine. You must and I experience that progressive work in grace number three the feast of first fruits that's the next feast where we recognize that God is the owner listen of everything and I bring him the first fruits a a a a, a percentage a a portion of that uh, benefit and and resource that comes into my life I give that back to him and his kingdom uh, which is a, uh, a, a a a sampling that I'm acknowledging that God owns all of this in my life and yet he is only requiring asking uh, for the first fruits or even a tenth which is Old Testament, New Testament, it's 100%. But this is a, a, a sampling of, of, a, of a heart that says, I understand you've given all of this. And number four, beloved, I believe right here is a seal of a feast that has been broken. And uh, I believe that with all of my heart. I'm not the only one. I'm not saying it's us four and no more. But I want to share with you and, and then move into the fifth 
M, but this fourth M, uh, the Feast of Trumpets, uh, beloved, I believe we are in that feast. Now, again, Jesus has already fulfilled all of these. Now, the church and the Christian is in process. Uh, I forgot the Feast of Pentecost. Uh, that was the fourth feast. That is uh, the uh, infilling of God's Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2, Acts 8, Acts 19, uh, Acts 12. He wants you and I to receive the gift of His Holy Spirit. That's the fourth stage. And I'm sorry, the fifth uh, is the Feast of Trumpets. That's the feast I believe that God is, is broken and He's moved in now. And that's the stage we are seeing in the Church of Jesus Christ globally and within your life and mine as individual Christians. The Feast of Trumpets, beloved, is a feast that celebrates, watch, number one, it celebrates the Jewish New Year called Rosh Hashanah. The New Year of the Hebrew calendar is October 3rd, coming up to October 12th. It will be celebrated with the blowing of shofars, the blowing of ram's horns, the first day of Rosh Hashanah. It is a 10-day feast, feast of trumpets, celebrating, first day Rosh Hashanah, celebrating the new Hebrew year. The new Hebrew year, I don't know if you can see it uh, down here or not, but October 3rd will be the new Hebrew year, 5,785. 5,785. It begins the first day, the new year of the 10 day feast. It begins with the celebration again of Rosh Hashanah and the blowing of shofars and ram's horns as many as a hundred times, as many as different staccatos and different sequences. It is, it is a celebration of great joy uh, and, and acknowledgement that God uh, is, is, is uh, moving and uh, progressing uh, the uh, nation of Israel and the, and the uh, Orthodox Jew uh, that is there. The following nine days of that 10-day Feast of uh, uh, Trumpets uh, will have a continual blowing of ram's horns and, and antelope horns or long shofars and they will be intermittently blown in the remaining nine days, because the remaining nine days are called the days of awe. They are also called uh, the days of uh, repentance. They are also called um, Yom uh, Teruah. Uh, ter it is again, it is an introspection. Uh, it is a... Uh, uh, a, a time of repentance. It is a time of, of once again uh, coming into a place of sobriety of one's life before God. Um, it is a, a, a time of repentance. Uh, it is a time of really allowing God to do a, a deep cleansing within one's life. Ten, the total number of days in the Feast of Trumpets. Ten is the number of worldliness the number of carnality, the number of uh, 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 uncircumcised flesh. I got a host of scriptures here about the number 10. And so the 10 days of awe in totality of the feast the, uh, marks the, uh, the cleansing of uncircumcised areas of the flesh, a purifying uh, of the carnal life. And the lack of morality. See this, this feast, beloved, the Feast of Atonement, I believe the, the spiritual trumpets are blowing that God is cleansing uh, His Christian and His church globally. I mentioned to you that over 200 global mega ministries global have fallen in the last two years. There was another one even in, uh, in the States, in America, uh, which brings the total in less than a year to 17 major mega ministries. And just last week, one other major mega ministry, uh, uh, the leader uh, has fallen. And again, it's usually one of three things. It's 
it's uh, uh, glory, uh, it's gold, uh, or it's gals, or it's women. And again, it certainly was one of these surrounding the fourth em uh, called morality. Again, we are in, I believe, beloved, we are in the uh, Feast of Trumpets. The spiritual shofars are blowing. And what is God doing? What is the primary uh, work that's happening in this stage of the Christian's life and the church's life? God is going to clean his house. He said, judgment, discipline, cleansing comes in my house before I do anything in the unsaved world. He's cleansing his people. He's blowing the shofars. He's cleansing the carnality, the uncircumcised flesh. He's cleansing the worldliness, tin, uh, within your life and mine. Why? Because we represent him. You have his name, Christian, Christian, you know. We got four girls, and before they were married, I said, now look, you got my name on the back of your, your first name, and you have a greater name, and that's the name of Christian, and you must endeavor to represent him well. And so God is cleansing Malachi chapter 3, verse 3. God says that in these last days, I'm going to purify the sons of Levi. Who are the sons of Levi? Levi was the priestly tribe. He said, in the last days, I'm going to purify them and cleanse them with a refiner's fire. And I'm going to purge the dross out of gold and silver. You and I, the Bible says, are kings and priests unto God. You are of the tribe of Levi and you're the tribe of Judah, kings and priests. And he says, spiritually, I'm blowing the ram's horn. I'm blowing the antelope shofar and I'm purifying my church, my Christians uh, globally. And beloved, this is astounding even unsaved networks are declaring what is happening in the church what is taking place why so many mega ministries have fallen in the last year and two in our nation in Canada Europe globally so many he is blowing the trumpet in the feast of atonement in the feast of atonement and beloved these stages or feasts uh, must uh, uh, continue to accelerate and I want to just make sure we've done this in the past uh, a handful of years ago but beloved the Hebrew New Year on October 3rd 5785 beloved we are in the sixth day a day to the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as a day we are in the six thousandth year the fifth day's already passed we are coming if it's if 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 god's calendar please listen if god's calendar is aligned to their hebrew calendar i don't know if it is but if it's aligned if god's prophetic calendar is aligned to the hebrew calendar then we are getting close to the end of the sixth day we know the seventh day a day is to the Lord a thousand years. He said, make sure you take note of this and don't let it pass by. Be not ignorant. Then we are in, um, beloved, uh, uh, 6,000 years. We can actually historically go back and, 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 uh, and, and show that Adam and, and Eve, uh, in terms of their uh, um, genealogy, is close to 6,000 years. You go to the genealogy of, of uh, Luke chapter 3, verse 23 through 28, which we have done and, and showed that that calendar of going back to the genealogies, it gives you a genealogy that's one of two that goes all the way back to Adam and it works its way all the way to Jesus Christ. And then you add in the years that you and I have after Christ and the number is 5,942. Now again, our calendar is solar based on the Gregorian calendar. The Hebrew calendar is lunar based on the moon's cycle. All of that to say, we know that the seventh day, the seventh thousandth year, is the millennium. That's the day of rest. 
God worked for six days. On the seventh day, he rests. We are approaching the seventh day, which will be the day of rest, the millennium. Christ will come back, set his feet on the Mount of Olives. Uh, they, there must be uh, what there must be the fulfillment of the uh, feast of atonement the feast of tabernacles the great harvest uh, there must be fulfillment of these remaining three feasts that the church has not experienced yet we've experienced the feast of passover unleavened bread first fruits pentecost and we're experiencing i believe with all of my heart the feast of trumpets the cleansing feast the 10 days of awe yom teruah which again means there is this solemnness of introspection of of repentance of getting one's life cleaned experientially before god okay and so if this of if the Hebrew calendar or the genealogy calendar, we are nearing the end of the sixth day. The sixth day is highlighted. I'm spending too much time on this. The sixth day is highlighted, beloved, by the last, this, this deep, the last church age. So not only do we see the seven feasts, you see seven churches in the book of Revelation. Chapter 2 and chapter 3, Jesus wrote seven letters to seven historic churches in Turkey that I've been to with many of you. And we've explored some of the excavations that are there. But the last church that Jesus wrote to of the seven, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, the last church age that will be living upon the earth, will carry primarily a resume of what Laodicea was described by Jesus Christ. He spoke of Laodicea, and that is going to be the prominent, please listen, the prominent culture, atmosphere, climate of Christian people. He wrote to the Laodiceans, and he said, you remember, you're neither cold nor hot. Uh, you're lukewarm. I'll have to spit you out of my mouth. He said, you think you're wealthy. You think you have no need of anything. You think you are rich, but you don't know you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked. And he says, I advise you to buy from me gold. You're going to have to choose this and purchase this trial bought by uh, um, uh, uh, from me uh, gold refined by fire so that you become rich and he goes on and he lists the resume of the final church age that you and I are going to be living in before the end of the sixth day why is that so important is because you and I are getting closer to the conclusion of God's prophetic timetable He's not coming tomorrow. Jesus is not coming tomorrow. The rapture isn't happening yet. The revealing of the Antichrist, 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians, there, there are areas that must be um, completed before we have a rapture, before we have a second coming, there must be a, uh, uh, we must know the revealing of the Antichrist, is what your Bible says. We must know who it is. He must be on the earth. There must be a world government, a one world government, and, and on and on and on. What, a, what am I saying to you? I'm saying to you, if these two uh, calendars, or genealogy and the Hebrew calendar, are anywhere close to, to God, They have to be close to God's prophetic timetable because at the end of the sixth day comes the seventh day, which is the thousand year millennium where Christ will reign and rule upon the earth. So there has to be an exponential movement of these final three feasts for the church uh, to arrive at the fulfillment of the prophetic assignment God has given. What do the seven churches represent? They represent primarily seven church ages. And it doesn't mean that they can't have some mixture within them. It's not just, it's not just you know, um, uh, Laodicean. There'll be some Philadelphia Christians in there um, that have, uh, you know, then there'll be some uh, 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 Smyrna Christians in there. But the primary um, climate and culture and life of the Christian is going to be Laodicean as this culmination, the ending of the sixth day. Lukewarm, 
neither hot nor cold, uh, 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 carnal, fleshly, and and uh, and and so that being said, the seal of the feast of trumpets is blowing. That God is releasing, refining, cleansing His church and His Christian. Two hundred global mega ministries fallen and the lambs and the sheep within them shattered separated and in bewilderment 17 one just last week major ministry the leader has fallen he was just put in place he was just put in place he was knighted he was uh, uh, quote anointed the signet ring was put on him and then things started coming out that he's had sexual relationships and, and a host of things that, listen, it breaks my heart. And so I want to protect you, that business, that ministry, and you, the Christian, to realize that this is a time of, of, of trumpets to take inspection uh, yom Terra Ru, and begin to look and to see if there are areas that you and I can um, begin to see cleansing, to walk away, to turn away, to repent from. Now, beloved, I gave you 15 places in your Bible that, uh, that the uh, shofar and the trumpet is blown in your Bible. And again, uh, the, the final one I gave you was the actual Feast of Trumpets. And again and again and again, that shofar from heaven is blowing globally right now and uh, and so be prepared and prepare uh, yourself I have here just uh, quickly how you and I can become a trumpet and I'm going to swiftly go through that uh, because beloved uh, not only were there 15 places where God was using shofars rams horns horns and trumpets but he desires that you and I would become a trumpet. Your Bible says that even a trumpet can become a voice. Uh, and God and Moses heard God speaking. The Bible says his voice was like a trumpet, like a shofar. And God wants you and I to be that shofar. I, uh, in this uh, 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 place where we are now in the Northwest, I didn't bring my antelope shofars or my ram's horn. I would show the, uh, these to you and demonstrate them, but I'm sure you've seen them. And so uh, you and I can become a trumpet, okay? And how is that going to happen? I'm going to go quickly. Number one, there must be a death for you and I, uh, uh, for the Israelite or whomever, to have that ram's horn, to have that antelope horn, and to, and, and to begin to, there must have come a death. There had to become a death of that ram. Uh, even Abraham, when he was offering up Isaac in uh, uh, Genesis uh, chapter 12, um, there had to come a there had to come a death of that animal for a voice to be used, a, a ram's horn to be blown. There must be a death in your life and mine. You must be willing to die to self and uh, let God process me through that. But at least a willingness, that animal, that life has to be willing to die to be used as a trumpet for God, as a voice for Him. He doesn't need any more people that are alive in carnality, in flesh, and there hasn't been the, the cleansing, purifying work of God to be a trumpet and to be a voice. How do I become a trumpet in these uh, last uh, uh, waning uh, years? You must be willing to die and say, Lord, take my life. Here I am. Cleanse me. Do whatever you want to do. Number two, uh, you must remove all of the flesh uh, within that uh, shofar, within that ram's horn or that uh, shofar horn. You must, they have, once the death has come, they take the horn and they have to cleanse the flesh out of that horn. And again, if there is flesh remaining in that shofar, it is going to impede the voice and the sound of that shofar. If I am full of flesh, full of Steve, full of carnality, full of uncircumcised areas and it hasn't been cleansed and, and purified, it is going to bring a distortion to the sound in the voice of that trumpet. He wants to clean me out flesh uh, soul and spirit, okay. Uh, number three, uh, you then sand, you sand down the, um, the uh, uh, um, 
the horns, uh, some of them have ridges and, and, and areas that can cut uh, within someone's hand. Um, they must be smoothed out. And this refers to my attitudes, my personality, uh, my moods, dispositions, temperaments. Um, God is endeavoring and wanting to, uh, uh, to, to smooth Steve out. So it doesn't bring offense to someone else. And then when uh, he speaks, it's coming through a vessel, a, a shofar that's been cleansed, purified, and has been, again, smooth. Number four, um, the, 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 there has to be the drilling of a mouthpiece. If I were to have my antelope shofar, you would see a little mouthpiece in the, in the end of that, uh, that horn. And that had to be drilled out. It speaks of my mouth. Again, one of our hymns where uh, God is wanting to cleanse uh, my mouth and the words of my mouth and uh, my tongue. And, and so that, uh, that has to be uh, uh, processed in my life. Uh, number five, uh, there must be breath that comes through uh, that shofar. Uh, uh, that is the Ruach. We want the breath of God. I don't want Steve's breath in there. We want God to breathe. The Bible says in John 20, 22, that Jesus breathed on his disciples and said to them, you will receive the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And so we want God to breathe into you and I, whereby that voice, that breath comes out and it is the voice, it is the sound of heaven. Number, number six, it again must be polished now, not only sanded, it must be polished. It must be uh, again uh, inspected for debris and any other areas. And uh, so there are six quick ways how you and I can become a trumpet and a voice for God in these last days. Now, I don't have a bunch of time left, but I do want to move in and at least to uh, present to you the fifth M. The first M was manners. We talked about the encounter I had with the neighbor. Uh, number two, we talked about the second M, the mouth, how I speak. can actually cause dead flies to bring a stench to the anointing. Imagine if I'm a minister, I get up at church and then I go to eat somewhere and I'm dropping F-bombs and I'm doing this and doing that. Do you think that would have an effect on someone who is in the conference or in the church meeting or just people in general? Of course it would. Okay, number three, we talked about ministry, the third M, that you and I are in full-time ministry. You're in full-time ministry, okay? Number four, we just finished morality, and number five is money. Now, hold on. I know what you're thinking. Some of you have been beat with the cat of nine tails within church services <laughs> regarding giving, regarding money. I'm going to try to just give uh, some things maybe you haven't heard regarding the fifth M of money. Beloved, money now is a major issue in the mind of men and in the heart of mankind. Again, regardless of whether one is a Christian, whether one is a non-Christian, money carries that kind of power within the thoughts of man, and within the heart of mankind, regardless, again, of what nation someone is from, what skin color, what pedigree, where you've come from, what nationality, doesn't matter if I'm in India, Zimbabwe, Kenya, Canada, Europe, it doesn't matter. This issue of money uh, weaves its way right into the heart of mankind, regardless again of saved or unsaved, educated or non-educated, male or female. And uh, beloved money uh, is a topic that Jesus spoke about more than any other topic in the Bible. Did you hear me? Money was spoken about more than his second coming, more than the rapture, uh, more than salvation, more than deliverance, more than healing. He spoke about money more than any other topic in the Bible. Why? Again, because there is a connection with money in your heart and mind in respect to how you and I relate to God. Let that sit a minute. 2,300 verses in your Bible are on money. 2,300. 
11 of 39 parables I looked up on money alone. 11 of 39, Christ spent most of his ministry dealing with the issue of money. Again, why? Because money is a key um, uh, entity that, listen now, you and I have to come to grips with. We're going to have to deal with it. And as a Christian, we must endeavor to deal with it according to God's teaching and according to God's uh, Bible. Okay. And again, regardless whether it's a mima, papa, grandma, grandma, regardless of any of that, we want to endeavor to walk in obedience uh, to God's word. We want to know how to use this agency, entity of money, and to use it according to uh, God's word, regardless of situations and circumstances, wants and desires. We want to endeavor to use money the way God would have us to use it. Beloved, here we go. Jesus made a statement that if you and I can't manage money well, um, and we can't manage money properly according to his Bible, listen to what he says. How can you and I manage spiritual riches? Luke 16, 11. If you can't manage or be trustworthy, Jesus said, in stewarding worldly wealth, mammon, how can you be trusted with true riches from heaven? So he said, now look, this issue of money has to be settled properly if you're a Christian. If you can't manage uh, biblically how to manage this money issue uh, correctly, he says, then how can I give you true riches of, of the, um, listen now, of the empowerment to heal people, the empowerment to raise the dead, True riches, uh, how, can I, can, how can I grant you the, the nine gifts of the Spirit and operating and functioning in those? How can I grant uh, to you uh, the, the understanding of the fruits of the Spirit? How can you, how can you now be anointed fully or, or do deliverance fully? How can you uh, experience some of the true riches that he, he said, if you can't handle this money properly, I can't, listen, I can't give you the true spiritual riches of just some of what I just shared with you. Maybe, listen, maybe that's one of the reasons why we have not seen demonstration of these areas working prominently and predominantly in his local church or the Christian. One of the reasons is that we've not managed this issue of money properly according to God's word. According to his word. How can I give you spiritual riches if you can't handle the lowest denomination of earthly riches, money, or mammon? And so again, maybe that's one of the reasons why we've not seen much demonstration of deliverance, of healing, of raising the dead, of, 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 of commanding healing, of the uh, uh, fruits of the, uh, of the Spirit, of discerning, um, of, of uh, uh, wisdom, the gift of uh, 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 word of wisdom, word of knowledge, discerning of spirits. Maybe that's one of the reasons. And I, listen, I believe, beloved, through the remaining three feasts that God is going to cleanse you and I, and we're going to uh, center ourselves um, through uh, uh, this feast properly concerning money in your life and mine. First Samuel chapter 16, 1 through 5. Uh, beloved, watch, watch this. This is the prophet Samuel. Uh, the, the, and I'll read it to you. Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for King Saul? For, for uh, I've rejected him from reigning and ruling over Israel. Fill your rams, or fill your, he had a horn, fill your horn with oil and go. I'm sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, uh, David's father, for I have provided myself a king amongst his uh, seven sons. So Samuel did what the Lord said, went to Bethlehem. Watch now, key issue right here. Samuel went to Bethlehem, as God instructed, and the elders of the town of Bethlehem trembled at his coming and said do you come peacefully and he said peaceably i come and i've come to sacrifice to the lord and to uh, and he says now you sacrifice yourselves i'm coming to jesse and to his sons and to anoint a king over israel 
Look at the, the honor and the reverence and the fear of a man of God coming into a city where the people came out and trembled and said, Are you coming peacefully? Are you coming peaceably? Again, God is going to restore, listen now, the honor. He's going to restore the power. He's going to restore uh, the uh, uh, respect. Uh, he's going to restore the, the uh, image of the Christian and the local church. But he must cleanse us first. The church primarily, especially with each and every single minister and ministry fallen, it's almost a laughing stock to the world. But it won't remain that way. God will be raising up and blowing the trumpets. Okay, now closing here on quickly five things that might be causing or for you to consider as a hindrance for this uh, monetary um, movement to be happening properly in your life. It's a long point, isn't it? I want to uh, give you five areas that are potential hindrances for the understanding of money to function and to operate properly in your life. I want you to consider these. Maybe, why is this happening? How come I don't have enough? Why is this not happening? And this, and all of this, maybe there are, uh, I want to share with you five potential hindrances.